One of the great joys that I have as a parent of four children, four boys, spanning a full decade of time is to see the many stages of their growth repeating. <laughs> it's pretty fun. There are many milestones along the way as my boys grow. My oldest is 17, my youngest are six. I've got a 15 year old here too. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to see how they develop and grow. Among the most important milestones to me is learning how to ride a bike. <laughs> As you have heard me speak quite a bit uh, over the years, you know that bicycling is a dear passion of mine and I enjoy it tremendously. It's, uh, it's really fun to see uh, my boys find the same kind of joy that I've found. And this past week, my son Jude, he just learned how to ride a bike. In his willful character that he has, I had uh, come up to the boys, the twins that we have, and said, let's learn how to ride a bike this weekend. Jude was full of determination, as I mentioned, and he spent uh, a full week gradually uh, making you know, steps towards riding a bicycle. We started out just taking the pedals off of a bike so we could get the sense of balance. He went between that and the, the kid-sized bike that fits him and the little strider bike that has maybe 10-inch wheels until he felt comfortable. He was gradually increasing his comfort. And throughout the week, he would go just a little bit further, just barely outside of his comfort zone, and pushing a little further and further. And uh, it was just enough to keep it fun and rewarding without being discouraged. Basically, that means keeping crashing to a minimum. <laughs> but there will be a day, there might be many days, when there will be the inevitable bicycle crash. Probably several times that is going to happen. And Jude, I'm afraid it's going to hurt. <laughs> I speak from experience. Bicycle crashes tend to be pretty bloody experiences. Uh, skinned knees, scraped shoulders, stitches, broken collarbones, all uh, types of things uh, among the many other ways of being injured on a bicycle. And uh, it takes time to heal from a bike crash or any kind of injury. Some injuries heal a little bit quicker than others. Some, some tend to take several weeks, as my son Nolan will uh, be able to attest to. <laughs> he will be able to share a little bit about some bike crashes if you would care to quiz him. And some injuries, um, they don't heal in our lifespan. That is the way pain, suffering works in our life. Pain and suffering and healing are part of the human experience. And I'm not just talking about the physical kind of pain and suffering that uh, we talk about. I'm not talking about physical healing exclusively here. Something we don't talk a about a lot because it hides within is emotional healing. That can be deeply damaging as well if it doesn't go through a healing process. This human experience of suffering and healing is deeply embedded in the plan of God, and I will elaborate on that today. Again, my title is Healing. Suffering physically and emotionally will come to an end. Even the interminable physical or emotional trauma that we may have not found healing for in this lifetime will eventually find relief forever. That is the plan of God. We are physical beings, corruptible, corporeal, flawed, vulnerable with all kinds of weaknesses, physical and emotional and otherwise. To go through life with pain and struggle is perfectly human. It is something that every single one of us can relate to. Sometimes, again, without 
the relief that we so desperately seek in these days. But today, we will look beyond the physical constraints that we experience. We will cover physical healing and emotional healing. And along the way, we will focus on the components that factor into healing. And finally, we'll review the end of the matter as the kingdom of God is established here on earth. I'd like to bring up a few examples of physical healing today, looking at several of Christ's healings. I'll I'll begin in Luke 8 and verse 43, if you want to turn there with me, or if you want to listen along, there's going to be a lot of storytelling today. Luke 8, beginning in verse 43. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment, speaking of Jesus Christ, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng you and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out of me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. Oh, oops. <laughs> I guess I did that. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Uh, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. After a very long time that this woman had had suffered, she was so apparently desperate for healing. She had one more thing to do. In this instance, she believed that simply touching Jesus the corner of his garment would be enough for her to be healed. And it did. What is the element involved in her healing here? It's not a mystical healing event. It's not some kind of magic that happens when you touch Jesus Christ. Jesus declares plainly that it was her faith that led to her healing. She believed that Jesus was able to heal her, and that factored in powerfully into her healing. Her faith is what made her well. I need to talk a little bit about faith. Many of us have come to God faithfully asking for healing and not having received it in our timeline. It raises that question, what is wrong? What am I doing wrong, right? Faith is involved in healing. Quite simply, without faith, there is no reason to think that God will heal us. He still might choose to heal us, but without faith, we can have no expectation that he will. I need to talk a little bit about this element of faith. Uh, I'm reading from Matthew 13, verse 58, when he is talking about those from Nazareth, where he was from. Matthew 13, 58 says quite succinctly, Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Isn't it interesting how Jesus Christ, this man who was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure, couldn't do his miracles because there was no faith, no belief that he could do this. He wasn't able. Faith plays powerfully. Turning to James 1, verses 6 through 8, we read a little bit about faith and doubt. James 1 and verse 6, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. 
when we apply this concept to healing that we might ask for, it is so important that we believe that God will heal us. It will be on his own terms. That is something we need to realize, however. It is not on our terms. Once we, return, once we turn our request over to God with faith, we can be certain that he will do it on his terms. He will give us the healing that we need, that he believes that we need the most. And that can be difficult. Sometimes what we need, in God's perspective, may not be what we so desperately feel that we need. As we know, Paul came looking for healing multiple times, and his answer that he received was, no, Paul, your suffering is important. So moving on from that, I do want to talk more about healing. Another example of Jesus Christ healing somebody comes in Mark 1, 40, and verse 41. Mark 1 and verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. This shows another example of someone suffering from a scourge of seemingly interminable illness. It shows the same kind of faithful belief that Jesus would heal him that we had read about earlier. But in this instance, we see something else being picked up in this moment of healing. Did he pick up on it? What was it? This time we see Jesus is moved with compassion. When was the last time that you could empathize with someone else's suffering so that you were moved. That's what Jesus felt, that compassion. When was the last time that you were in need of somebody else's compassion? Desperately hoping that someone could just understand you what you're going through, from within your own skin. That's what this man needed. Jesus Christ knew that's what this man needed. He was moved with compassion. That is the element that was included in this moment of healing. Jesus Christ has compassion for us when we come to him seeking for it humbly. Matthew 9, verses 1 through 8. We read another example of healing, and this time picking up something new. Matthew 9, verse 1. Again, speaking of Jesus, so he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. Then behold, they brought him, brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sin, your sins are forgiven you. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your thoughts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. 
And he arose and departed to his house. Now when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, who had given such power to men. Once again, we see faith involved here. People in this situation were faithful. They brought him a paralytic on a bed, a man who could not move. He was brought to Jesus, and what did Jesus say, seeing this man who was clearly coming to him for healing? Well, he didn't heal him physically right away. But he told him something else. He said, your sins are forgiven. Pretty interesting. Only after that moment when he offers forgiveness did Jesus heal this man who couldn't walk. We see forgiveness taking place in parallel with this physical healing. Jesus Christ came to this earth to offer us relief for physical healing, as we are thinking about today, removing illness and sickness so that physical life can be enjoyed, unencumbered, but also a different kind of healing, healing of our sins, removing that penalty of damage that we have done to ourselves so that we can be healed and enjoy eternal life unencumbered. Healing and forgiveness, as we will elaborate today, are very close cousins. In this example, we can see that Jesus Christ offers up both in the same instance. I want to talk about this element of forgiveness in more depth today. Forgiveness is a type of healing. Let's turn to Psalm 103 and read in verse 3. Psalm 103 and verse 3. Actually, I'll begin in verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Looks like I started in verse 1. Verse 3. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. These things are happening side by side. Our iniquities, our sins, are spiritual injuries to ourselves. They do damage to us. They incur a penalty of death. The only way, the only way we can recover from this is through God's forgiveness. God desires to heal us from our diseases as well, giving us physical relief. I'm going to turn to a scripture often brought out during the Passover season. This is from Isaiah 53, verses 2 through 6. Isaiah 53 in verse 2. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As we hid, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. As all we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The role of Jesus Christ is so important for us to understand. Again, we usually cover this during the time of the Passover when we consider the role of Jesus Christ in sacrificing his life for us to heal our sins, but also to heal our physical ailments. The suffering that he experienced was physical, but it was so emotional too. He was carrying our sorrows. He did that for us so that he could understand firsthand what it is like to be human, to have compassion for you and me, what we go through, what we struggle with, our pain, our sorrow, our trouble. He did this to cover our sins, to heal our iniquities, and he did this to heal us physically as well. Going further on this element of forgiveness and how it relates to healing, Ephesians 4, reading verses 31, 32. This is Paul giving an admonition to the Ephesians, telling them how to behave. Ephesians 4 and verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. Anger begets more anger. Evil begets more evil. This is, of course, in the context of malice. Malice being that intention of hurting somebody else. Boy, it can sure sneak up on us, can't it? Sometimes we don't even realize if we're intending to hurt somebody in our heart, making that flaw. It can be sneaky. But the instruction that we have from Paul here is to be tender-hearted. Consider the compassion that Jesus Christ had when he healed the leper. He was able to put himself in the skin of this man, knowing what he was going through. He was tender-hearted, loving. Kindness, forgiveness, it has a corrective effect in our relationship with others. Paul is giving us this instruction. This kind of behavior is healing. Going to Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14. Colossians 3 and verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. That's our example to follow. Forgiveness is, of course, an expression of love for another. This is the example that Jesus Christ gives to us to follow. It is what he requires 
of us. If we desire for him to offer us forgiveness and healing, we ought to behave the same way for others. It's what we must do. People will mess up all around you, will cause you offense, they will cause you grief, and sorrow, and frustration, anger. How are you going to respond? When we are offended, we can return the offense and make matters worse. Or we can look at the instruction here. Be tender-hearted. As Christ forgave you, you must also do. Forgiveness heals. Going to 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 through 10. Second Corinthians 2 and verse 5. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent not to be too severe. This, puni- this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love for him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed you, I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. In this instance, Paul appears to be speaking about someone in the congregation. This one, uh, again, apparently experienced some sort of punishment for what he did. And what does Paul say? Enough. You've let this man be punished. Now, forgive him. Comfort him. If you continue in punishment, what will happen? He will be overcome with too much sorrow. That does damage. Reaffirm love for this man. Don't dig in and condemn him further. Reaffirm your love. This man may have deserved punishment, but it was enough. Move on. Express your love. That is what we are identified by as Christians, aren't we? We are identified for as Christians by our love for the brethren. Love is what heals. Jesus Christ, God the Father, offered us love so that we can be healed. Forgiveness is an expression of love. We understand from this example of Jesus Christ that the forgiveness of our sins is the ultimate example of love that Jesus Christ and God the Father have given for us. For us to receive emotional healing, we participate in this process of forgiveness. Think about what these Corinthians were doing here in turning their active condemnation and punishment towards love. They were healing their relationship with this man, healing the congregation even. What we see is that this participation in the process of forgiveness, both asking for it with a repentant attitude and also giving it to those whom we love, has a healing effect. When we are moved with compassion for others who have offended us or whom we have offended, having empathy for them, we show our love and we begin the healing process. And it is reciprocal. I believe you've all experienced the reciprocal healing effect of forgiveness. I have a couple examples that I want to bring, just a few 
uh, vignettes of stories from the Bible. There are many. Uh, I had to trim my 40 scripture sermon down today. So if you need more, I can give you more. But today we'll just focus on two examples. I'd like to start with David and Saul. Let's turn to 1 Samuel and we'll read a few passages in chapter 26. First Samuel 26, and I'm cutting in here uh, in verse 7. To give you a little bit of context, David, as we know, was pursued by Paul, or sorry, pursued by Saul, who was threatening his life. David was having to hide, run away, flee from this wrath of Saul. And here we see a, a moment where David has Saul and his company trapped. First Samuel 26, beginning in verse 7. So David and Abishai came to the people by night. And there Saul lay sleeping within the camp, and with his spear stuck in the ground by his head. And Abner and the people lay all around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David's life is in jeopardy here. He could put an end to it in a moment, in an instant. He had an opportunity to kill his pursuer, to put an end to this thing, again, returning wrath for wrath. But he refused because it would have been sinful to do so. You could say also that David was moved with compassion for Saul, not to do him this harm, but to correct things in their relationship, to forgive him in a manner of speaking, and offer him this mercy. For Samuel 26 and verse 12, So he does something different. Again, David is, his life is still threatened. He knows this. (laughs) So what does he do instead? So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away, and no man saw or knew it or awoke, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Rather than kill Saul, David wanted to show that he was not a threat to Saul. By taking the spear and the water jug, it was evidence that he could have killed Saul, but chose not to. He chose to be merciful. He chose to be tenderhearted. He chose love. We see the conclusion of the matter in verses 17 through 22, when there is a a moment when they are confronting each other. I imagine David and Abishai up on a hill somewhere behind a thicket, you know, not necessarily fully exposed, but in shouting distance. Then Saul knew David's voice and said, is that your voice, my son David? David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O King. And he said, why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done or what evil is in my hand. Now, therefore, please let my Lord, the King, hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go, serve other gods. So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, For the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you 
no more. Because my life was precious in your eyes this day, indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. And David answered and said, Here is the king's spear. Let one of your young men come over and get it. Here we see an act of mercy, of love, of forgiveness, and healing. This relationship between these men is healed, at least in part, at this moment. Prior to this moment, Saul was ready to run David through. We can be sure that this healing moment was not a simple thing to do, but these men, they understood each other at that moment. They forgave each other. We can understand why David was a man after God's own heart. He was moved for compassion for his enemy. And he chose to be compassionate, tender-hearted, empathetic, and loving instead of respond with violence to his threat. Another example of forgiveness that we see has to do with Joseph and his brothers. This will take us back to Genesis chapter 45. I will begin in verse 1. Genesis 35, beginning in verse 1. Of course, uh, did I say Genesis? Yes. Let me make sure I'm getting this right here. I'm on. Yep. Okay. As we know from the story of Joseph, his brothers had sold him into slavery because they were jealous of him. They, some wanted to kill him as well, right? He was put into slavery. He was in jail many years. He suffered so much, especially in an emotional way, having been abandoned by his family. And we see at this moment, as his brothers are returning to Egypt because they need help, Joseph is now seeing his brothers after decades of being away from them. And we see this forgiving, this healing moment take place. Genesis 45 and verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, does my father still live? But his brothers, boy, this is a reunion, reunion, isn't it? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. Really thrown off, right? (laughs) We thought you were gone. Uh, And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near me. So they came near. Then he said to him, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me there. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph at this moment had come to bear with his experience. He had suffered as a slave and a prisoner because his brothers had sold him into slavery, as we know. Joseph knew that it was purposeful, that it was meaningful, that it was to put him into a position so that he could offer his services in a way that he may not have been able to had it not happened. Of course, Joseph is careful preceding this moment. He had been careful with his interactions with his brothers before this point. He chose not to reveal himself. But at this moment, he puts that all behind him, and he reveals himself to his brothers. Reading Genesis 45, verses 14 and 15. 
Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. At this moment, we can see the healing process take place. We see how Joseph had offered his forgiveness to his brothers for what they had done to him, that contemptible thing they had done. He was deeply hurt by what his brothers had done to him, and his brothers were apparently sorry for what they had done as well. But this process of forgiveness, we see both sides healing emotionally with tenderheartedness for one another, understanding one another, and growing from it. Now, in looking at these examples where forgiveness has opened the door to emotional healing and part of the healing process, it's important to consider the opposite side of forgiveness. The opposite side of the coin, rather, of forgiveness is repentance. Repentance plays a very important role in healing as well. Repentance precedes forgiveness, but we'll take a look and see this role of repentance as it relates to physical healing as well. I'm going to 2 Kings and reading verses uh, from chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. This is a story about Hezekiah. He uh, had suffered. His life was in danger. And he found healing following his repentance. Second Kings 20, beginning in verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. And he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord of God, sorry, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. David faced the prospect of death. He was sick near dying. God tells him, this is it. It's over. And in response, Hezekiah contemplated something. We don't read exactly what that was. But his bitter weeping, we can see here as an act of humility towards God. His healing came after he had humbled himself before God with a repentant heart. Interesting how repentance plays a role in physical healing. Second Chronicles, verses 7 Sorry, verse 7. Chapter 7, verses 13 through 15. Second Chronicles 7, verse 13. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal 
their land. Now my eyes will be open and my tears, uh, sorry, my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Healing is a result of humility before God. Turning from sin and wickedness precedes forgiveness. Precedes the healing, in this case, healing of the land. If we want God to hear our prayers, including our prayers for healing, we must be humbled, and repentant, asking him for mercy. Because we are sinners, we need healing inside and out, physically and spiritually. Reading Psalm 6, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 6 and verse 1. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. The fear of God that we see here, expressed because of the sins that David is cognizant about in his life. The healing that he requests is for the bones that are being troubled. Such a physical, a visceral illusion of physical suffering. Do not chasten me for my sins. Heal me physically. That is what he prays. Reading to you from Psalm 41 and verse 4. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. In this short passage, it's so easy to read over it, but I want to look at it a little more closely. This, again, we see an example of repentance from sin. It is involved in healing. The healing requested here is for the soul. That word, soul, is translated from the Hebrew word nephesh, And that refers to the living, breathing, physical person. That is not the spirit, the ruach. It is the physical being that he is asking for healing for. And what is the reason for the apparent physical suffering that he sees here, that he acknowledges, It's his sin. We can see everything captured here in this short passage. The emotional anguish, the physical suffering, going to God with a repentant, humble attitude and an open heart, pleading for mercy, pleading for compassion, pleading to God to heal it all. This is what God has planned for us is healing. This Feast of Tabernacles pictures a future time at the millennial reign of Jesus Christ when healing will be pervasive. Let's turn to Psalm 47, and I'll read verses 1, sorry, Psalm 147. I'll read verses 1 through 4. Psalm 147, verse 1. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This applies to the end time when people will be returning from captivity to Jerusalem, those outcasts. We can see both kinds of healing expressed from this example. Being brokenhearted is that emotional state that requires healing. It's not a physical one. Having wounds bound up describes physical healing. This is what will take place when Jesus Christ returns. 
Turning to Isaiah 51, reading verse 11. Isaiah 51 and verse 11. So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That is delightful. I so look forward to that moment. This describes those people returning from their time away when they have suffered. Those moments of trouble will be gone. Isaiah 65, verses 18 and 19. Isaiah 65, and verse 18. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. It's all gone, all of it, even the interminable stuff, it's terminated. In the kingdom of God, there will be a complete change where sorrow, pain, suffering, they are gone. Healing will be everywhere. Isaiah 35, verses 3 through 10. Isaiah 35 and verse 3, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer. Frank, I'm looking forward to seeing that. (laughs) <laughs> Not that you're lame, but you know. It's the deer part that I want to see. And the tongue of the dumb shall sing, for waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and a road. And it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. It's gone. Feels like the opposite sometimes when sorrow and sighing come rushing in. It's going the opposite direction. Scripture we love to read from Revelation 21, verses 3 through 7, about this time when the kingdom of God is established. Revelation 21 and verse 3. Let me get there first. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, physical or emotional. For the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give at the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. When Jesus Christ is here on earth establishing his kingdom, there will be a whole lot of healing going on. This speaks about the glorified, perfect state of people at that time when there is no more death. All the grief, all the mourning, the suffering, the pain, the agony, it will go away. In our lives, there's no shortage of pain and suffering and struggle. None. In talking with many of you, I hear about what you're going through. That's why I get so emotional talking about this stuff, you guys. Some things are tremendously challenging. Some things are smaller in scale, but still very intense and difficult. And even life-changing. Whatever you are going through, I encourage you to actively involve yourself in this process of healing. We have seen today some of the ways in which it works. Our faith demonstrates to God that we trust him to heal us in the way that he knows we need it. Our repentance and humility to God show him that we are submitting to his will. This opens us up to having our iniquities healed, our sins forgiven. It also shows that we are submitting to God's will in our lives so that we can receive the healing that comes through Jesus Christ. And of course, the other side of forgiveness, uh, sorry, the other side of repentance, which I just mentioned, is forgiveness. We participate in forgiveness. We don't have to wait for that. That is an intimate part of the healing process for us today. Both forgiving others and seeking forgiveness ourselves. Forgiveness is a big deal. We look to God for forgiveness for our sins. We look to others for forgiveness as well. Offering our forgiveness has a healing effect on both sides, on those who look for healing, on those who offer the forgiveness. That's right, that's what I meant. When we seek forgiveness, it invites healing to begin. Jesus Christ was brought to this earth to be sacrificed for the purpose of healing. He heals our iniquities, those sins that do damage to our spiritual lives. Think about the damage, the injuries that we have that we need healing for. This needs to be healed, and Jesus Christ is the only one who can do that. He also heals our physical bodies. He gives us an example of forgiveness that we must follow, which beautifully results in emotional healing in our lives today. We are going to struggle through this life that we have, experiencing physical pain, emotional pain. It's not going to end today. You may work through some things. Some things may heal, but certain injuries may happen again. We work continually to increase our faith, our humility and repentance, and follow Christ's example of forgiveness until that day when our physical lives do come to an end. But at the time when Jesus Christ finishes his work and utter those words, It is done. All of that agony and pain will be gone. The tears from emotional struggle will be wiped away. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that day comes quickly.